Good morning and welcome. Welcome to this, our second Sunday of Lent, as we come together to continue our journey and study the life of Jesus the Christ. Know that wherever you are on your journey, wherever you have been, you are welcome here in the house of the Lord. Now, let us join in our opening call to worship. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. Bless the Lord, you angels, who obediently do God's bidding according to the word. God's kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you angels and people, who do the will of God. God's kingdom consists of all the created, seen and unseen, earthly and heavenly. Bless the Lord, all you works, in all places within God's kingdom. Come, let us worship our God for all of this. I am a part of that created kingdom. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us join in the hymn, O my soul, bless your Creator. My friends, it is great to be here with you this morning, to be taking this journey at Lent with you as we study and look at what the example Christ left for us may have been all about and why God may have told the story or had the life lived out the way he did. Now, seeing as we have been called into worship, let us join our voices in invoking the name of our God. Eternal good, uniting Father, Creator and King, hear our prayers and praise as we come in search of you. Be with us as we seek to do your will here on earth by loving those you give us to serve and those you have called us to serve with. Brothers and sisters, our God not only calls us into worship to pray and to praise, to learn, but also to be transformed and made new. Let us do so now as we join in our prayer for transformation and new life. Let us pray. Holy God, sometimes we think we know better than you do. We make our own attempts to save ourselves and others from the cross-filled path that you called us to walk. Help us to get behind you because it has become easier to rely upon ourselves 
rather than on your strength and presence. Grant us grace and help us to let go of our need for control so that you and your way might be our guide and path forward. Amen. Please hear the words of grace. Dear ones, may the God of compassion, Jesus the wounded healer, and the Holy Spirit who shapes and transforms us anew, grant you peace and hope for your soul. For we know that the one who calls us to follow in the way of Jesus is merciful and offers the consolation of love in a world of empty promises. Be at peace, and thanks be to God. May it be so, now and forevermore. Please join me in the hymn, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, verses 1 through 23. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When he had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that had been seen in the east, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said to him, Get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he was infuriated, and he went and sent soldiers and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentations, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Here ends the reading of God's word. May it have rich blessings on your lives. So when we left off in the story last week, we had seen the birth of Jesus. We had heard about the trials that Mary and Joseph had gone through. And we had seen how he had been welcomed into the world by the shepherds. And that's where we left off, looking at how hard life must have been for them, and how they were to support one another on this journey that they were taking. And so now we begin today. And the Bible puts into perspective for us everything that's going on. It dates it for us in a couple of ways. First, it tells us who was king at the time, Herod. It puts us in a place, Bethlehem. Note that they remain in Bethlehem. And some time has passed now. Jesus isn't a little baby anymore. And the Magi have come, and they've talked with Herod. There's a lot of journeying going on, and all these various journeys are happening at once, and life is taking place. So the first journey we're going to talk about is that of the Magi. Now, they came from the east. We don't know how far from the east, but from the east. And you can be pretty much guaranteed it probably took a good deal of time to get there. According to our story, it sounds like it may have been close to two years from the time they first saw the star to the time in which they arrive at Bethlehem. Because Herod, when he finds out that the Magi have left, has all the children two and under 
killed. Those are just some of the things that are happening. But the Magi took this long journey. No, they were rich men. They had gold and frankincense and myrrh. They came bearing gifts and camels. They had wonderful things with them, and probably a full caravan of people. They had come to see Jesus, but they took this long journey, and somehow or other they end up going to Jerusalem. They know that to be where the king exists. And they go and they start asking about this new child, the king. And when Herod hears about it, he calls him in, pulls him off the road. A little bit of a detour for him for a second. Calls him away and says, tell me about this child. So they tell him everything they know and about the prophecy that they've read and how the star rose and everything that is supposed to come about from this child. And Herod and the scribes and the Pharisees and all the people are scared by what the Magi have told him. Well, let's stop there for a second because there's a couple of detours happening here, right? First off, the Magi have been called and they've been called to a detour off of their own journey. There's a detour happening in the rule of Herod. Herod, everything was going along well. He's got a child. He's raising that child up to be the next king. And suddenly, there's a detour. There's a new king, he's being told. And it was prophesied about. Now, Herod was a Jew. If these prophecies were coming true, he needed to make sure that this king wasn't going to interfere with his line. Slight detour. Then the Magi go on, they find the baby and his mother. Two years, remember, two years old. Find the baby and his mother in the house where the star has stopped over it. And they go in and they give their gifts. But more than their gifts, they tell Mary more about Jesus. Now it's not just the shepherds that have come to tell her great things about her son. But here come these kings bearing gifts to lay before the new king. Imagine how that must have felt for her as she sat there in Bethlehem. Note the story tells us they're still in Bethlehem. A little bit different story than we got from the last one. But the Magi were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they took another detour off another way. That's when Joseph has his dream. And here's where a detour in life seems to happen for them. See, because suddenly Joseph is told to go to Egypt to flee because Herod is looking for, the son, for his son to kill him. So Joseph does just that. In the middle of the night, in the dark of night, he grabs Jesus and his mother and he flees to Egypt and he stays there until he is told to come back. He's told that Herod is dead. Jesus is no longer in danger. And they can come back. And on his way, on this short detour he took in the life that he had in Bethlehem, on his way, he has another dream. And here, he finds out that Archelaus is now the king in Herod's place. So Herod the Great is dead. But the Herod we're going to hear at the end of Jesus' story has taken rule. So Joseph, worried that things might not go the way he thought they would go, takes another detour. And rather than going back to Bethlehem, he goes to Nazareth. 
unwittingly fulfilling the prophecy that Jesus would be a Nazarene. Now I told you that these were all a bunch of detours. But we have to ask the question, are they? Are they truly detours? Or is it the fact that this is the way it needed to be? Each step fulfills part of the prophecy. Each time Jesus does something, or something happens in Jesus' life, part of this journey that he's taking, each time that happens, another part of the prophecy is fulfilled. And not just by one prophet. Okay, So when it says the prophet, they're talking Isaiah. But then they name Jeremiah. So it's not just Isaiah, but also the prophet Jeremiah, whose prophecy is being fulfilled about the Messiah through this child and the journey that they're taking. Even for the wise men, for the magi, the detours that are being taken change their journey and their understanding. The detour they took down to Egypt, that time that Joseph takes away from his career and from everything that's going on just to protect his child. The coming back and the detour that he takes to go to Nazareth rather than to Bethlehem to keep Jesus safe for his fear. Note that that last detour was his doing. Because I want to talk about these detours in a lot greater detail. Because we have these detours in our lives too, right? All of us had a plan. My plan when I left high school was I was going to develop the next line of computers. I had a plan. I had somebody that was going to help me with the electronics end. I was going to do the programming. And I even knew somebody who was going to do the book work. We had it all planned out. Best laid plans, right? Or as the old joke goes, you want to hear God laugh? Tell him your plans. God has a way of helping us to where we need to be. I never thought I would be where I'm standing now. This isn't what I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be the head of a multi-billion dollar company as far as my original plan went. But I was 18. What did I know? At the time, I thought I knew it all. Now, looking back, I can see the detours that I've taken. See, because I took a detour with alcohol. And then I had to get back on track. And then moved from one place to the next. Places I had never planned on being. Places that weren't part of the original map that I had laid out. God changed the plan. We took some detours. Through my dealing with alcohol, I've learned how to be more compassionate and forgiving. Through my time moving to other places, I learned how to be a foreigner. Somebody who wasn't from the area. Through some of the things I've gone through, it's changed who I was and how I look at life. These detours make us who we are. So now you've got Mary and Joseph, who last week, remember, had learned to support one another. They're raising this child, and now to keep the child safe, they're taking these detours. Well, isn't that the way things happen in life? How many of us have done things for the sake of our children, for their betterment? Whether we understood that it was going to make it better, or whether we thought it was going to make it better and made it more difficult, whatever the case is, there were these detours we took to the best of our ability to understand. But I often wonder, are they really detours, or were they part of God's plan to start with? I mean, I'd hate to think that God went through and decided that I had to go through everything I did with my alcoholism and that I'd like to think 
those were decisions I made, detours I chose to make, and the plan that God had for me. And over and along the way, God has made the best of the mistakes I've made, the trouble I've caused. God has redirected me and put people in my life to help me become the person I am, to get me back on track, to guide me. Just as the Magi came in to be guided, they wanted to know where this king was to be born. And they found out through the scribes and the Pharisees, people who knew better than them. Joseph listened to the angel in his dreams. Then he thought to himself, hey, yeah, Herod's son is probably not going to like Jesus. I'm going to go over here so he doesn't know anything about him. Now we see how well that turns out at the end of the story. But for now, for now, they're little detours. They're changes that have been made to the story to help us to understand, to change who we are. We still have our support systems. We still have hard times that are happening. I can't imagine that going down to Egypt was an easy road for, for Joseph and Mary. Or for Jesus. None of these detours were easy. I bet they had some fun along the way, though. I bet they saw some really neat things. I can imagine what it was like for Jesus in Egypt and seeing all these wonderful sights. Completely different land than he was used to. Or that he's going to be used to when he grows up. They were detours, or were they? See, we're going to have some detours on our journey, aren't we? We're going to have some times when we think we understand what's going on, only to find out later we weren't thinking very clearly. We're going to find people that are going to support us and uplift us and make us feel whole, and those who are going to tear our lives apart and make us worry and fret. We're going to have the Herods, in other words, and we're going to have the Magi who bring us gifts. We're going to have parents that are going to care. And there's going to be those who just don't care at all. And they're going to make mistakes and make decisions, the best decision they can, based on the information they've been given. That's what Joseph does at his deciding to go to Nazareth. He makes the best decision possible on the information he was given in hopes to keep Jesus safe. As we take this Lenten journey, let's take those hard times that we've been given, those parts of the journey that we just don't like, add in those times when we're given the gifts and the wonderful places to go and to see the short detours that take us off to wonderful spots. Let's take the people who God has given us to love and those who support and love us. Let's pull all of that together. And let's give thanks to God for the great and wonderful insight into the lives that we lead so that we could know more fully the love and care, the gift and the plan of our God. So until we meet again next week and look at the next leg of the story, be thankful. Listen. Look for where God is supporting you with people. Rejoice in the good times. Enjoy the detours. And know that your God has this. And you're okay. And all God's people said, Amen. Please join me in the hymn, God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale. i
come to that point in our service where we look at the generosity of our God, the gifts we've been given, the invitations we're given in order to join into that same type of generosity. And we've come to give back, to make our vows, to give what we can. So let us do so now as we join in our invitation to generosity. In a world that offers a vision of never enough, we share in God's abundant provision for all. While we could gain the world but lose our soul, it is from within our soul that we share in a generous spirit of giving. In these moments of silence, make your vows of what you will give back to your God. Please join me in prayer. Giving God, Jesus invited us to give our lives away, to take up our cross and to follow. Rather than exchanging our souls, may the sharing of these gifts nurture our commitment to walk in your way. In the name and the way of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace as you travel this Lenten journey. May you a close relationship with God. Go in peace, my friends. Please join me in the hymn, Take Up Your Cross.
My friends, I'm so glad you were able to be here today. And it is my sincere prayer and hope that something about today's surface has inspired you to be moved, to change something, to become transformed and renewed. And now I ask for your help. First, please pray for us. Pray that we would have the wisdom and the strength to do the ministries that God is calling us to. That we would have the wisdom to use the resources we're given to bring as many as possible to God's table. Then, if you haven't done so already, in a few moments, you'll see a few buttons and a couple of videos come up. One of those buttons will be a cross with a green cloth on it. That's our subscribe button. Click on it so that we know who it is that's being a part of this ministry with us. And finally, if you feel so moved and so called, click the Donate Now button and give as God places upon your hearts. Know that whatever you give goes to continue ministries like this, our children's ministry, our family ministry that we have here at the church, the mission and work that we do within our community and the greater world. Whatever gift you give, no matter how great or how small, is considered a generous, beautiful gift that allows us to continue ministry as God calls us to do. Know that it is through the generosity of people just like yourself that we are able to continue God's mission in the world. Now, until we meet again, may God bless you and keep you and give you peace. Have a blessed week.